everyone, and welcome to the video. So today we're going to begin our discussion on meiosis. And this is a, a topic that hopefully won't be too hard for us to adjust to because we've learned some pretty similar information for this in the past. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of meiosis, we do have some other information to cover first that will allow us to more deeply dive into meiosis. To start off with that, we are going to start by talking about some chromosome vocabulary. Chromosomes are not new to us. We've definitely encountered them when we talked about mitosis, but we are going to start to apply some more specific terms to them moving forward. The first one of those is the idea of sister chromatids. So when we think about sister chromatids, these are going to be two chromatids in the same double-stranded chromosome. So as labeled in our picture here, both of these should be sister chromatids. So this purple chromatid here is a sister with this other purple one, and this green chromatid is a sister chromatid with this other green one here. So this is just a term that we use to talk about two chromatids within the same double-stranded chromosome. And when we think about it, these two sister chromatids should be genetically identical to each other. If we take a look over here, we started off with single-stranded chromosomes. So we have a single-stranded purple chromosome and a single-stranded green chromosome. And we went through this process of replication. What we hopefully did is we made an exact copy of each of these chromosomes so that our sister chromosomes have the same exact genetic information to each other. These sister chromatids should be genetically identical to each other. So keep that in mind going forward. Next, we have what are called homologous chromosomes. And during meiosis, we're going to talk about these chromosomes kind of pairing up with each other. And the reason that they do this is because they have information for the same genes on them. So when we look, for example, at our two double-stranded chromosomes over here, we call these a homologous pair. And that's because they should contain information for the same genes on them. When thinking about where these chromosomes come from, we get one of our homologous chromosomes in each pair, one comes from each parent. So for example, this purple chromosome could come from one parent. This green chromosome is going to come from the other parent. The other important thing on here to mention is that these paired chromosomes will likely contain different alleles for the genes on that chromosome. So I was careful to say here that they contain the same genes. When comparing these purple and green chromosomes, a chromosome, these two chromosomes in homologous pairs, they are not going to be genetically identical, or they shouldn't be genetically identical. They are going to have information for the same genes on them, but their alleles should be different. So to explain that a little bit more, for example, we could find out that information on these homologous chromosomes could include uh, the gene for eye color, the gene for hair color, and the gene for height. Those three genes could be contained on these two chromosomes here. However, our purple chromosome could have a brown hair allele, while our green chromosome has a blonde hair allele. Or our purple chromosome could have a brown eye allele, while the, um, the, the green chromosome could have a blue eye allele. So in that example, they're going to have information for the same genes on them, but they're going to have different alleles for those genes most of the time. So it's important to keep in mind that chromosomes in a homologous pair usually are not going to have gen identical information. Lastly, we have two more terms to cover. We're going to talk about haploid cells going forward. Haploid cells, we have mentioned these before. These are cells that have half the usual amount of DNA. And when we think about those types of cells, those are most oftentimes going to be gametes. So those being our sex cells, our sperm and egg cells. Haploid cells are cells that have half the usual amount of DNA. In contrast to this, we have what are called diploid cells, and diploid cells have a full set of DNA. And we think of this as being most of our body cells. I think it's helpful to take a look over at this picture here to compare our diploid and our haploid cells. You should notice that we have similar looking chromosomes in our two cells here. In our haploid cell, we are going to have one copy of each chromosome in our cell. When we come over to our diploid cell, we have very similar looking chromosomes, but we are going to have two copies of each chromosome in our cells here. So that's the main difference between a diploid and a haploid cell. A haploid cell 
has one copy of each chromosome, while a diploid cell should have two copies of each chromosome. We're now going to try to put this into the context of human chromosomes. So we, so we talked about some of that vocabulary. We're going to apply some of that now. So when we think about humans, we've done some genetic analysis. We've opened up our cells and basically counted the number of chromosomes that we've had. So a full set of human DNA should be 23 pairs of chromosomes, or it should be 46 chromosomes total. A normal human cell should have 46 total chromosomes in it. Um, when we think about where these come from, again, we've talked about the idea that half of our genetic information is going to come from each parent. So 23 chromosomes we're going to get from one parent, where we're going to get the other 23 from our other parent. Um, when we think about how we pass down that information, these, these sets of information are going to come from us, come to us in the form of gametes. So a human haploid cell or gamete is going to contain 23 chromosomes. And this becomes important um, because scientists like to keep track of how many chromosomes different organisms have in their haploid cells. They came up with a different, a certain system to talk about this, and they came up with this idea called a haploid number. A haploid number is going to represent how many chromosomes an organism has in their haploid cells or their gametes. We represent this by saying n equals the number of chromosomes that they have. So for humans, n equals 23. When we think about this, we're also going to be able to talk about a diploid number. So if we think about the relationship between a diploid cell and a haploid cell, take a second to yourself. Think if we have a haploid number of 23, what would our diploid number be? If you were able to do some quick math or even take a glance up here, we should be able to figure out that our diploid number is going to be 46. And we, we basically say 2n is 46 because we, we have twice the amount of information here. As I mentioned on the last slide, slide, our diploid cells are going to have two copies for each chromosome in them. So 2n is going to be 46. So in this picture here, we can see a diploid cell. It is 2n. They have two copies of each chromosome. These, these would be homologously paired chromosomes. Do notice that they are a little bit different. They do have different genetic info on them compared to our haploid cell over here, which is only going to have one copy of that chromosome. Diploid and haploid numbers come in handy because they allow us to compare different organisms to each other. So I just wanted to take a second to, to show you a few examples of different uh, organisms and the number of chromosomes that they have in their cells. For those of us who don't know, this is a picture of a platypus. The platypus happens to be my favorite animal, so I thought it would be fun to take a second to look at the number of chromosomes that a platypus has in their cells. And when scientists did this, they found that the haploid number of a platypus is actually 26, which leaves their diploid number to be 52. The main reason I wanted to try to show this to us is to show that the number of chromosomes that you have in your cells does not necessarily define the complexity of your cells. Because as we can see, a platypus has more chromosomes in its cells than humans do. And I, I would say that most people, even myself, would concede that platypi are not more complex than humans. Most people would think that humans are one of the most complex forms of life on this earth. Um, but we have less chromosomes than a platypus. So just because we have just because other organisms may have more chromosomes does not make, necessarily make them more complex. And to show us another slightly more varied example, we have a plant here. This plant is called adder's tongue fern. Um, and this is a pretty interesting plant. Um, the reason for it being is when scientists analyzed a cell from adder's tongue fern, they, they, they were in for quite a surprise. Um, adder's tongue fern, as far as scientists know, is the living thing on Earth that has the most chromosomes in each of its cell. In a full set of adder's tongue fern DNA, their haploid number is 630, leaving their diploid number to be 1,260 chromosomes. So again, I think this really kind of drives home the point that just because an organism has more chromosomes does not necessarily mean it's going to be more complex. There is a lot of information that they have on these chromosomes, um, but this is for a plant, which most people would not consider to be more complex than a human. 
The last thing that we're going to talk about today is continuing on this idea of how do we analyze genetic information? How do we look at chromosomes? The main way that scientists have figured out how to do this is through this idea, this tool called karyotypes. Karyotypes is going to be the process of organizing and photographing the chromosomes of an individual to determine possible genetic abnormalities. So the main reason why we are going to do karyotypes, we're usually going to focus on doing this in humans. And what we can basically do is scientists take a picture of chromosomes and basically they're able to sort them and look to see if our genetic information looks normal. Um, what we should notice here is that our chromosomes are numbered, our chromosome pairs are numbered, and they are sorted into homologous pairs. So we sort chromosomes into their homologous pairs, and we sort them in order from largest to smallest. Hopefully we see that trend here. Um, pairing one is going to be our largest chromosome, slightly smaller for two, three, and then all the way down the line, we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we have our pairs. Um, and this is, again, a tool that we can use to try to determine if someone may have a genetic abnormality. So researchers can use karyotypes to identify possible genetic disorders or disorders that an individual may have by examining any differences that an individual may have in their karyotype. So this is a pretty typical looking karyotype. What we should see is we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We, we already determined it is normal for a human to have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we should see two chromosomes in each pair, and the chromosomes in the pair should be about the same size, and they should look pretty similar to each other. And so this is a very normal-looking karyotype. What I wanted to take a second to do is to actually look at some examples of some different karyotypes that, that may be a little bit different from what we're used to seeing. So I have displayed here two different karyotypes. Um, they, they look very similar, but there is one major difference between them. I'm going to ask you to pause the video briefly, try to find the main difference that we should be able to find between these two karyotypes. All right, so while I do recognize that they're, the shape of the chromosomes might be a little bit different, the coloration on them might be a little bit different, the main difference that we hopefully picked up on is in this spot down here at the bottom. You may have noticed that these are numbered. I pointed out they go one, but then it stops at 22. Um, and then we have X and Y in these two spots. And we should notice that between these two karyotypes, there's not the same information covered here. And this is because our 23rd chromosome pair is an important one. It's one that scientists can look for. Um, the 23rd chromosome pair is what we call our sex chromosomes. And scientists have discovered that these are the chromosomes in humans that determine our biological sex. So basically defining whether we have male or female reproductive parts. So, so this 23rd chromosome pair, we can kind of say, is what can determine what type of reproductive parts we'll have, and it determines our biological sex. So we'll notice here we, we have X and Y. So this individual, they have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Well, this individual has two X chromosomes and no Y chromosomes. You may have learned this before, but to tell you what these mean, if you have two X chromosomes shown in this karyotype, this should mean that you will have female reproductive parts. Um, two X's codes for a female, while having an X and a Y shows a, a, a male. You're going to have male reproductive parts. So these, this 23rd chromosome pair determines our biological sex. So XX is female and XY is male. All right, so now I have another karyotype. It shows the whole screen here. Um, this one might be a little bit more tricky to find the difference, but go ahead and take another pause. Try to see what difference does this karyotype have that, is, that makes it different from these typical karyotypes we were just looking at. All right, so it may have taken you a second to look through all of our different chromosome pairings here, but what you may have noticed, the, hopefully the difference you saw, comes down here at the bottom. Um, so at the very bottom here, uh, we're going to have uh, an interesting mutation. You should have noticed that we have three 21 chromosomes. 
So we kind of have a triplet of 21 chromosomes. This is a mutation, a relatively common genetic mutation called trisomy 21. And this is actually the genetic mutation that causes Down syndrome. So this is a relatively common thing that can happen while a new uh, organism is forming. Uh, and it causes the organism to have three copies of the 21 chromosome in all of their cells. And this causes people to, to have Down syndrome. Um, so it's an interesting, uh, interesting genetic kind of disorder to consider, and it's very easy for us to see in a karyotype, which is why we talk about it in this example. And I have one more example to show us. Um, so again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video, go ahead and take a second, see if you can notice the difference in this karyotype. All right, so in this karyotype, you hopefully should have noticed maybe you went through all of these pairs here. All of our numbered pairs are all going to be all set up. They, there's all only two in each pair, and they all look about the same size. However, what we notice here hopefully is a difference in our X and Y chromosomes, our sex chromosomes. Hopefully we remember if you have two X chromosomes, that should be a code for a female. And if you have an X and a Y, that should be male. But this individual has two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. And this is, again, a, another relatively common genetic disorder um, that's called Klinefelter's syndrome. So for most people who have Klinefelter's syndrome, they, they won't actually know that they have it. Um, they will only really figure out that they have Klinefelter's syndrome if they have a karyotype of one of their cells done. Um, most people get through life, they only have very mild symptoms. Uh, individuals who do have Klinefelter syndromes will have male reproductive parts, but because they have this extra X chromosome, they can actually show some more feminine traits by either having larger hip bones or by having less hair on their body. Um, they in some way might show more feminine appearances. So another interesting genetic kind of situation for us to consider. All right, that is going to wrap up today's video. Uh, and the next one, we'll be diving into meiosis. Thanks for watching.